What's happening, y'all? Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange. Danny and Bush coming at you with a Superflex mock draft and Superflex draft strategy video today. This was requested a couple days ago. I can't remember by who, but he said he had a Superflex draft on Friday. So we haven't done a lot of Superflex content on the channel in redraft season. We did a lot of it during the Dynasty season, but we figured we'd get into a Superflex mock and help you Superflexers out there dominate your drafts this coming season. Yeah, no, absolutely. Again, a lot of you out there are in one quarterback leagues, but for those of you that are in the super flex redraft leagues, again, myself, Corey are in a lot of super flex dynasty leagues. You need that input. You need that advice. And there's not a lot of super flex redraft content out there on YouTube right now. So we're going to help you out. We're going to hop into a super flex uh, draft and similar to the early round strategy videos for one quarterback. It's not a micro player analysis for analysis video. It's more so a macro general roster construction theory based video that will help you guys in the long term because just seeing a regular mock draft and seeing who we pick is not going to help you out more so than explaining the ideology explaining the construction value of how we're doing so so i'm excited i'm ready to roll again i'm a, I'm a big theory guy myself i love explaining the overall aspect of team building but before we get into that video as always we're gonna hit the intro All right, so we're going to start off this video basically describing the differences between Superflex and one quarterback and the differences between Superflex Dynasty and Superflex Redraft. So to start off, Superflex versus one quarterback, it's pretty simple. Adding that Superflex spot, basically what a Superflex represents is a spot where you can put a quarterback, a running back, a wide receiver, or a tight end. Basically a regular flex spot, but you can add a quarterback to it. And the reason why this is suddenly taking over the fantasy football industry is that it gives a lot more emphasis on having a good anchor quarterback because the position is a lot more scarce. You would have heard over the years, everybody say, oh, you, you can just punt the quarterback position. You can just punt the quarterback position in your one quarterback leagues. Adding a super flex spot makes it so that they are a more scarce resource because typically you'll see if you're in a 12 team league, 24 quarterbacks started on a week to week basis. Whereas if you're in a one quarterback league, only 12 are started, decreasing the scarcity factor of the position. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And in that super flex spot, more often than not, you're going to be starting a quarterback because even bad quarterbacks, like, for example, if you were starting guys like Jeff Driscoll last year, even a bad quarterback is going to outscore your typical RB2 every single week because even a bad quarterback is going to throw a passing touchdown, get like 200 yards passing, and that's like a 10, 12-point week in fantasy. So if you have two great quarterbacks, which is what you ideally want to have, in super flex and then a third quarterback to help kind of build out your depth, then you're going to be at an advantage at that position. And it, it throws another wrench into the strategy factor of fantasy, because then all of a sudden you're not just focusing on getting running backs, wide receivers and tight ends. Now quarterbacks have a lot more value. Now you need to uh, strategize how you're going to attack the position and how you're going to attack the other positions in relation to where you selected your quarterback. So we're going to talk about taking quarterbacks early, taking quarterbacks in the mid rounds, fading quarterback, in super flex strategy. So I'll let you talk about kind of what's the difference between dynasty and redraft because in dynasty super flex, the quarterback position is very valuable. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll preface it by saying the difference in dynasty and redraft as a whole is that you look for players that will have long-term longevity, will have appreciating asset value. And the quarterback position is the basic biggest example of that, because typically speaking, as much as we love our running backs, as much as we love our tight ends, wide receivers, the quarterback position, especially at the elite part of that tier, is going to have the most longevity. Your Patrick Mahomes is going to be playing at an elite level for 10 years. Dak Prescott, Lamar Jackson, et cetera. So it raises the value on these guys when you can hold them throughout basically their entire careers. And when you're on the clock in a dynasty super flex league and you're faced with, I don't know, let's say Dalvin Cook versus Kyler Murray, the, the, the decision would be Kyler Murray at that point because you know, okay, as good as Dalvin Cook is right now, he's probably only a two to three year asset whereas Kyler Murray should give me top five quarterback production over his career. So in Dynasty, I would take Kyler Murray. However, when you're relating it to a redraft aspect, when you're saying one year, chips on the table, I'm trying to win the championship, in that situation, I would prefer getting that elite running back over the elite quarterback. So it's kind of the theory aspect. Where's your cutoff? What's your last quarterback that, or what's your last running back that you would take over an elite quarterback and starting to implement that in your drafts 
in redraft is how you gain the advantage over your leagues. Right. And as we did for the early round strategy videos, we're not just going to sit here and talk about super flex strategy. We're actually going to show you a mock draft. We're going to go through and talk about our th line of thinking because we, we do differ in this area of fantasy because Danny in super flex dynasty and super flex and me in super flex dynasty, we both kind of value quarterbacks a little bit differently, which is one of the biggest differences between our analysis. I'm more of a, I will take middle tier quarterbacks and supplement my production elsewhere at elite running backs, elite wide receivers. You like to get that advantage, getting those elite quarterbacks, the Kyler Murrays, Lamar Jacksons, et cetera. So let's get into the mock draft and show them exactly what we're talking about. All right. So we're in the mock draft board right here. And before we get in, we're going to randomize our spots. And yeah, as Corey alluded to, I like getting in a, a super flex dynasty, that anchor quarterback because of the longevity aspect. But we'll see how the board falls in uh, the redraft video. And again, let's preface this by saying these exact players I am taking, if you disagree with the analysis, doesn't really matter. This is the macro theory roster construction aspect video. This is not just your bog standard mock drafts. I've gotten comments on a couple of these saying, oh, you're taking too many Cowboys players. Don't focus on the exact players. Focus on the exact strategy, the position, the tier-based drafting that we want to implement in these videos. So let me just randomize our spots and then we can take over with this video. You have the two spot. I have the 12 spot. So perfectly, we can kind of see the uh, balance across the board here. So. Right. And if you want to show the roster so they can see who exactly we're drafting. So we have a quarterback, two running backs, two wide receivers, a tight end, two flex spots and a super flex. So again, we are going to be drafting a super flex, basically a two quarterback draft. So quarterbacks are going to go a lot higher than they typically would in a standard uh, 12 team, one quarterback league. So now a lot of people at the pick I'm currently at, there's a decision that you probably have to make. Do you want to go with the elite quarterback in Patrick Mahomes? Or do you want to go with the elite running back in Alvin Kamara or in Dalvin Cook? I am of the belief that I trust my drafting in the mid rounds that I will be able to fill up my quarterback position easier. I think it is way more difficult to get an elite running back like Alvin Kamara, who's going to be my pick here, than it is to find elite quarterback production because we have some of these late round guys like the rookie quarterbacks and uh, some of the Ryan Tannehill's Tom Brady's that I think I can get elite quarterback production later in the draft, whereas I'm not going to find an Alvin Kamara late in the draft. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and I, I agree with you with that pick. Again, the main emphasis that I have in a super flex redraft league is that I want to get one anchor running back. I want to get one anchor quarterback. And at your spot, Alvin Kamara, as, as much as I love Patrick Mahomes, let's, let's talk about it as a pairing. Would you rather Patrick Mahomes and Austin Eckler or Alvin Kamara and, I don't know, we'll say Ryan Tanhill? The choice is clear to me. I think uh, Alvin Kamara, the advantage he gives you at the running back position in a one-year redraft league is more viable. So that being said, I am on the clock here. And this would be a tough decision. Again, my one pick, it's going to be Dak Prescott. I know that there's a tier cutoff after him at the quarterback position. And I am fine with getting my one anchor quarterback because I do believe he's got a top five outlook on the year. The thing that I would have to debate here is whether I want to go with an Ezekiel Elliott or a Devontae Adams. And typically, if this was a one quarterback league, you guys know my love for wide receivers, pound it, pound it, pound it. But because I don't necessarily want to reach on running backs later on in the draft, rounds three to seven or so, and because this is a half PPR format right now, I'm going to get the little cowboy stack with Dak and Zeke and... um you I'm might as well just that. throw that whole conversation you had out the window because you just took two straight Cowboys to start your draft. Yeah. Uh, again, as Danny mentioned, it's not about the micro analysis, what players he would take. And maybe you like Justin Herbert more than Dak Prescott and you like Najee Harris more than Zeke Elliott. Like I do. I have Najee Harris rated higher than Zeke Elliott. So I would have taken Najee Harris if I would have went with running back there. And you guys can see I'm now on the clock. And one thing I wanted to just preface real quick, if you guys are curious where you should take these elite quarterbacks, for me, I would take the top five overall players on my board before I take Patrick Mahomes. So to me, that is Christian McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara, Dalvin Cook, Saquon Barkley, and Devontae Adams. I would take all of those guys before I take Patrick Mahomes. And then from that six to like 12 range, I would sprinkle in Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Kyler Murray, Lamar Jackson, and Dak Prescott. That's kind of how I see the top tier of quarterbacks, Patrick Mahomes being ahead of guys like Derrick Henry. And then you have uh, guys like Jonathan Taylor, Zeke Elliott, Najee Harris, I'm more comfortable taking those anchor quarterbacks over some of those running backs because I have a bit more questions about those guys than I do about Camaros and and McCaffrey's yeah. and and Dalvin Cooks. Yeah, and that's where I'm at as well. Again, I, I'm a good amount higher on Zeke than you are. If Zeke was gone there and I was looking at you know the barrel of like the, the Aaron Jones area, I personally would have gone with Devontae Adams. But in half PPR, they're currently back to back on my board, so. I felt comfortable making that pick there, knowing the the potential consequence 
of the board with the quarterbacks and running backs probably coming off the board in abundance with within my pick and uh, leading back up to that 312. But you're back on the clock here. I know the pick. You can basically talk to them about it. Yeah, so I was hoping at quarterback to get, if I was going to go with a quarterback here, I was really hoping Justin Herbert would fall to me. Justin Herbert did not fall to me, so therefore I have a tear break at the quarterback position. I don't think Aaron Rodgers is quite worth this pick, in my opinion. I would probably need to wait a little bit on him. Same goes for Tom Brady, who would be my next rated quarterback, and then Ryan Tannehill after that. So I'm going to wait at the position. Hopefully I can get two great quarterbacks in. Uh, I might take one at 3-2. I might take one at 4-11. Who knows right now? But looking at the, the board right now, my highest rated wide receiver pretty convincingly is Stephon Diggs. Looking at the running back position, my highest rated running back pretty convincingly is Antonio Gibson because of the scarcity of the running back position, because I think I can fill up my wide receivers a bit later. I'm going to take Antonio Gibson. I do have him rated higher on my overall board in one quarterback formats. I would take him over Diggs in a one quarterback league. And the fact that I compare Alvin Kamara and Antonio Gibson as my top two running backs in the super flex is definitely something I love to do here. So we do see Aaron Rodgers go off the board. If he had fallen to me at the three, two, I probably would have just picked him there, but I'm actually going to punt the quarterback position, probably try and fill it out with some more mid round guys. Hopefully I don't wait too long. And again, this is why you do mock drafts, right? Because if I don't take a quarterback here and I come to realize that Matt Ryan's the best quarterback that comes back to me at four eleven, then in your actual draft, don't do that. Take a quarterback here, take Tom Brady, take Ryan Tannehill, whatever quarterback you're looking at. So I'm going to kind of limit test here and see if I can get good quarterbacks on the back end of the fourth round in the early fifth round. So what I'm going to do is take Stephon Diggs here because he is a very highly rated player for me. He's a top 15 player on my one quarterback board. He's still a top 20 player for me in super flex. So I, I really like the way I started my draft. Now let's hope some of these good quarterbacks can make it back to me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm just looking at the board and, uh, <laughs> There's a there's a clear two picks here, and again, I'm going to get all the freaking comments saying, "Why are you taking so many Cowboys?" But You're not seriously going to take CD Lamb and Amari Cooper, are you? No, no, I was going to take Terry, Terry McLaurin and CD Lamb, but okay. like, why does the boards fall to me like this? In my opinion, the way I view it is Keenan Allen. Actually, I didn't even notice he was on the board. Keenan Allen and CD Lamb are my top two wide receivers on my personal board. If you have Terry McLaurin over CD Lamb, if you have Freaking Allen Robinson versus CD Lamb. So be it. Take them in this spot. But looking at the board here, Keenan Allen and CD Lamb are in that nine ten, or top 10 wide receiver spots in my ranking. So as a result, I'm going to go with them. And this makes my decision, in my opinion, of taking Zeke at that spot over uh, Devontae Adams a lot more viable because looking at the running backs on the board, I would much rather a Keenan Allen or a CD Lamb versus even a DeAndre Swift. As much as I love Swift, you still got the question marks uh, about his preparedness going into the season. So as a result, my four stack right now, absolutely loving it. Got my anchor quarterback, my anchor running back, and now you're just going to pound wide receiver. Right, and I'm absolutely ecstatic right now because my quarterback nine fell to me in Ryan Tannehill. Yeah. And this is why I like to fade quarterback because I usually am able to get Tom Brady, Ryan Tannehill, Matthew Stafford, one of these guys in this tier, in this late, if I had a late pick like you, I probably would have went with Tannehill even at 312. So that's exactly why I, I don't like going with anchor quarterbacks because I'd rather get anchor running backs. And in a super flex format, you're going to get better value at running back too because people are going to be more concerned with quarterback. Otherwise, there's no chance I get Antonio Gibson at the 211 in a one quarterback format. He's usually an early second round pick. And at that point, I think this is why a lot of people like super flex, right? Because in a one quarterback league, everybody just smashes running backs at the beginning of the, uh, at the beginning of the draft. And you're left with no running backs by the end of the the two, three turns. So I'm going to take Ryan Tannehill here pretty convincingly my uh, quarterback, like my highest rated quarterback available. And looking at the board right now, I think I'm probably going to need to take another quarterback because I don't think some of these great options are going to get back to me. I'm looking around at the other positions. Mark Andrews, the highest rated tight end. I think that's a little early for him here. Looking at wide receiver, Mike Evans is currently my highest rated wide receiver. At running back, I'm not really liking anything there. So at the quarterback position, currently my highest rated quarterback is actually Trey Lance. So I am going to wait at the quarterback position. I'm going to see if Trey Lance or some of these other guys can make it back to me. Maybe Justin Fields makes it back to me. Maybe even like a Tua Tungvaluwa makes it back to me. So again, maybe this you don't want to do this in your regular draft. You try it out here in a mock draft format. And if it doesn't work, then maybe you go with a quarterback at that 5-2. But again, I'm going to try and limit test a little bit here and see how I can, uh, if I can get away with, with fading quarterback again, because in my opinion, Ryan Tannehill is good enough to be an anchor quarterback for me. So if I have to go with two lesser options to be strong at running back and strong at wide receiver, like I'm going to be, I'm going to 
you know, kind of get away with that. So with Mike Evans as my wide receiver too, I have Stephon Diggs, Mike Evans, Alvin Kamara, and Antonio Gibson as my primary position players. I think I'm going to be very strong from that perspective. And I still have a good quarterback in my opinion with Ryan Tannehill. Yeah, I agree with you there. Again, Ryan Tannehill was a clear pick and you mentioned Trey Lance. Let me just quickly look on the board tight end. I'm not taking anybody here after Mark Andrews goes wide receiver. I'm looking at a decision here. Do I want to go with a Cooper cup and a Trey Lance or do I want to pound both wide receiver spots and take uh, a Brandon Ayuk and a Cooper cup? And at this point, because I got my anchor quarterback, I don't necessarily have to feel pressured into just taking another one here with this elite wide receiver talent on the board. So I'm going to kind of pair stability with upside and take a Cooper Cup, my 17th rated wide receiver, my highest guy left on the board, and pair that with the upside of a Brandon Ayuk. And again, any of these three wide receivers are perfectly fine in this build, but I personally have Brandon Ayuk 18, T Higgins 19, Claypool 20. So I'm going to stick to my board. Right. And you could have gone with DJ Moore there. You could have gone with Robert Woods there over Brandon Ayuk yeah. if you're not necessarily a believer. Again, as Danny mentioned, you could have gone with Tyler Lockett. This is not a micro kind of analysis video. Whatever receiver you would have went with there is, is just fine. So now I'm back on the clock at the 611 and kind of a dream scenario fell to me because I already have Ryan Tannehill as my anchor quarterback. What I'm going to be doing is basically what I've been recommending to you guys all off season, especially for the past month or so. And I'm going to get myself a Kirk Cousins, who is currently my highest rated quarterback as a veteran. And the reason I went with Kirk Cousins instead of Trey Lance, who I'm going to go with right now, is because I knew Trey Lance would fall back to me because team one already has two quarterbacks. So to pair Kirk Cousins and Trey Lance, it's exactly what I wanted to happen. That's it. Basically, with those three quarterbacks, with Tannehill, with Cousins and with Lance, I can start Cousins and Tannehill at the beginning of the season. And then Trey Lance can take over once his schedule kind of or once he takes over the starting job for Jimmy Garoppolo. Yeah, I absolutely agree here. And I, I got absolutely uh, messed up here that team three took fields and team 11 took Mayfield because I was going to go with them on the turn. But that does open up wide receiver value for me. I see the breakout potential with Jerry Judy. I like that. I'll just take tight end here, running back, nobody here. Oh, there's actually one name here that I like. And because I have a modified hero RB, if you will, getting a Trey Sermon here to pair with my Ezekiel Elliott. I kind of like how that lays out. So as a result, I'm going to take them and I got my anchor quarterback. Let's just hope value can fall to me. Right. And you're playing with fire a little bit because you, a little bit. I mean, Tua Tungavailoa definitely could have been a, a direction you could have went there instead of taking a Trey Sermon. If you guys, you know, really are high on Tua, you definitely could have went with him there, paired him with Dak Prescott, and then you get a good kind of upside swing at that point. So looking at the board, uh, kind of all around, I have two anchor running backs with Antonio Gibson with Alvin Kamara. So I'm really not looking at running back quite yet. Damian Harris is definitely interesting at the running back position, but I'm going to see what's available at the other positions. Again, I already have three quarterbacks, but I've, I've kind of said again, all off season that if you're in a super flex league, Zach Wilson and now Mac Jones, now that he's the starter are great QB threes to have because you know that neither of those guys are going to lose their jobs. They're both rookie quarterbacks that are going to start the whole season now that Cam Newton has been released from the Patriots. So I really love those guys in a super flex format as my quarterback three to get some upside. If I had gone with a Ryan Tannehill and a Kirk Cousins, and then I didn't take Trey Lance, I took somebody else, took Chase Claypool or something like that. Then on the way back, if a Zach Wilson had fallen to me, I definitely would have went with a guy like him here. So uh, the quarterback position, I'm not going to be looking to do that because I already have three QBs. Looking at wide receiver, Will Fuller, it looks like he's the highest rated wide receiver on the board for me at tight end. Noah Fant is already gone. who's a big time target of mine. So I'm not going to be looking in that direction. So I'm going to go with Will Fuller as my highest rated wide receiver. He's going to be my wide receiver three. And another, I have another pick here. I was really hoping Damian Harris was going to fall to me there. He did not. So looking at the board right now, Antonio Brown's interesting. Jarvis Landry's interesting. Uh, Corey Davis is interesting. Elijah Moore is interesting. So looking at the board, I am actually going to go with Elijah Moore because he is my highest rated wide receiver currently available. He's my wide receiver 33, I believe, in fantasy this year. I think this kid's phenomenal. I think he's going to light up the league as soon as he steps steps foot on the field for the Jets. So I love getting Will Fuller and Elijah Moore there. Like that's just two upside swings to play in my flex spot week in and week out. Yep, absolutely agree there. And I love how you mentioned uh, getting a veteran quarterback to pair with a rookie. I wanted Fitzpatrick to fall. That obviously didn't end up materializing, but I see here that my best options would be Zach Wilson is going to be my rookie. He's going to be my upside shot. And pairing with him is actually going to be a guy that, I don't know, pe people don't really love showing uh, showing the love to him. But I do think Derek Carr could be a solid 
quarterback two, three anchor while Zach Wilson develops. So I'm just going to pair them up here again. I could probably play the ADP game that he's listed a little bit lower here, but I already got a good enough value from rounds uh, one to eight to the point where I'm fine with quote unquote reaching on my quarterback two and three spot. And I still think that Carr and Wilson paired with Dak can give me serviceable backup production after Dak. So I, I'm fine with those two uh, values, if you will. Right. And you could have went with a Sam Darnold there. You could have went with a Jameis Winston instead of Derek Carr, but because you need that kind of stability while your rookie is, is kind of going through the bumps and bruises that he's probably going to be going through at the beginning of the season. I don't mind picking Derek Carr. Who's pretty much a lock for like quarterback 15 every single year. He's going to give you pretty stable production. And at this point in the draft, you're not really getting an advantage by drafting one player over the other, except in the case of Zach Wilson, because there's that unknown factor. So I think that Derek Carr pick is definitely warranted given the situation you were in. So at the running back position, again, this is not a board that I'm really excited about. AJ Dillon is currently my highest rated running back on the board. But again, I think at uh, rounds 11, rounds 12, rounds 13 is probably when I'm going to look to fill the running back position out because I do still see a lot of value at wide receiver. To me, Jarvis yeah. Landry, again, while Will Fuller is suspended, and Elijah Moore is kind of developing. I think I can use Jarvis Landry as my flex spot for the beginning of the season. The Browns have a pretty easy uh, schedule to start the year. And Jarvis Landry with Odell Beckham coming off of the ACL tear might be more involved in the offense at the beginning of the season. He could be a good trade uh, chip away once Elijah Moore and Will Fuller are ready to kind of take over that flex spot for me. So I kind of like that pick there. Looking at the tight end position again, I'm not I'm probably just going to punt the tight end position because every guy that I'm really looking at, like with Logan Thomas off the board, with Ro uh, Robert Tunyon off the board, with Noah Fan off the board, Tyler Higby off the board, I'm probably going to be looking towards a Jonu Smith, Cole Komet type of tight end. And I think I can get that in rounds 12 and 13. So I'm not going to be picking a tight end here. On the board right now, my best overall wide receiver is Corey Davis. I also have Henry Ruggs rated pretty high. I have Rashad Bateman, but he's dealing with an injury, so I'm not going to be going on him. I'm just going to kind of stack up these these Jets wide receivers, I suppose, and I'm going to take Corey Davis here. He is yep. currently my highest rated wide receiver, so I'm going to grab him. Yep, for sure. And uh, for the record, obviously, Gus Edwards would be our highest rated player, but it's not realistic to get him in the 11th round because of the J.K. Dobbins news. But anyways, I just kind of had to preface. Yeah, actually, I, I didn't actually notice that. Yeah. So yeah, Gus Edwards would have been long off the board right now yeah. in an actual draft. He probably would have went somewhere in that seventh, sixth round range, but the ADP hasn't quite caught up to the J.K. Dobbins news. So I kind of just like bypassed him. Absolutely. And I got my modified zero RB here with the Elliot and the Sermon. I like adding Naheem Hines to that group. And I don't really have to touch a wide receiver here. Again, I have a uh, five that I'm very, very comfortable with five top 25 wide receivers for me. So I don't have to worry about that here in terms of the tight end position. I still have a few names that I'm comfortable with. So I'm looking at running back and I see Tony Pollard, but I do have Ezekiel Elliott. And again, the one thing I will advocate is you want to handcuff other people's running backs. You don't want to handcuff your own. The reason being, you look for upside. You don't look for floor. If Ezekiel Elliott is missing time, I'm most likely in the in the drain anyway. So there's no point on just handcuffing him with Tony Pollard, in my opinion. However, I'm looking at the board here. Like an Alex Madison would be nice. Sony Michelle, James White is going to be the top name on my board here. And the fact that I kind of have this build, I can take my final running back, not worry about the position for the rest of it. I'm comfortable with doing that here. So I will go with James White and kind of see what falls back to me. Right. And because you have Zeke as an anchor running back, you can kind of just play the matchups with Trey Sermon, Naeem Hines, and James White. Maybe you don't trust right. Trey Sermon right off the bat at the beginning of the season because he is a rookie running back and we don't know what his role is going to be. So you can throw a Naeem Hines, James White into your lineup until we know what we're getting at a Trey Sermon. So I got sniped on Johnny Smith. He definitely would have been my pick there. Um, so that's a little bit unfortunate. I'm probably going to go with Cole Komet on the way back at tight end, but I'm going to try and lock down a running back if I can here. And you talked about handcuffing other people's running backs. I don't really believe in, uh, Daryl Henderson. So I'm going to take Sony Michelle with this pick and see kind of how that backfield shakes out. Maybe, uh, it's a 50, 50 timeshare and Daryl, uh, Sony Michelle has some flex appeal for me. He's a guy that I'm just going to be getting as running back depth because I don't really have anybody outside of my two anchors in Alvin Kamara and Antonio Gibson. So I'm back on the clock here. You guys are going to hear me talk about in the top sleepers video, Cole Komet. He is a target of mine. He's currently my tight end 12 in fantasy this year. I have him very high relative to consensus because I think he is a starting tight end for this team. I think he is going to be the guy that is the primary beneficiary of every target that is not Allen Robinson's in that offense. I think he is going to gel well with Justin Fields as well. So He's a guy that I love getting if I fade tight end, which is what happened here because Thomas, Tunyon, uh, Goddard, Higby, and, and Fant were all off the board outside of those top six guys.
Yeah, and I absolutely got sniped here because Team 7 decided to just take my late-round tight end and Jared Cook there. But uh, you know what? I'm still fine. Again, Austin Hooper, people are going to hate on him. It may be a boring, it may be a vanilla pick. But listen, we talked about the potential passing volume uh, uptick that we saw with the Browns last year. I think the biggest beneficiary of that is going to be Austin Hooper developing that rapport with uh, Baker Mayfield developing really into a good stable option, especially in the red zone for a team that I think is going to score a ton of points next year. Again, I think the Browns are going to be uh, one of the top teams in the AFC. As a result, Baker Mayfield, uh, Austin Hooper, Odell Beckham, Jarvis Landry, I think are all underrated assets in fantasy. So I'm going to go with Austin Hooper again. I want a Jared Cook, but shit happens. And if there's going to be one position I'm going to quote unquote fade in a super flex format, it's going to be the tight end spot. Cause looking at my team, I got my anchor quarterback, anchor running back, built out my wide receiver depth beautifully. And overall, I think I have a very good complimentary fantasy team to kind of stabilize apart from the tight end position. So I like what I did there. Uh, you can talk about your team as well. Right. And go to the top of the board real quick. I just want to yep. show them. Okay. So let's, let's kind of analyze the overall value of the quarterback position first, before I talk about my team. So we can see that a lot of the, um, the teams that Mahomes, Josh Allen, Kyler Murray, Lamar Jackson, Dak Prescott, that's typically where you're going to see those quarterbacks go, right? They're usually going to go within the first 14 picks or so. And that's, that's typical value. So if you want one of those guys, that's about the range. You're going to have to draft them. That second tier quarterbacks is generally one that I'm avoiding because yes. I don't believe a lot in Russell Wilson this year. I think Aaron Rodgers' touchdown rate, as much as we don't like to talk about negative or uh, positive, or, or as much as we don't like to talk about regression, I still think what he did was a little unsustainable last year. So I don't really want to take him in that early third round range. If I'm going to take a quarterback in that tier, it's going to be Justin Herbert if I can get him at the back end of the second round. But otherwise, I'm just going to smash running back value or wide receiver value like I did with Antonio Gibson, Stephon Diggs. With the third tier of quarterbacks with Jalen Hurts, with Ryan Tannehill, with Matthew Stafford, Tom Brady, Joe Burrow, whatever quarterback you like in that range, this is the tier I'm looking to get my quarterback one if I didn't get one of those top end guys. So I'm kind of, if I get the top end guys, fine. But if I don't, I'm going to bypass that second tier and go for those third tier guys, try and get a Ryan Tannehill, a Tom Brady or a Matthew Stafford, which is the top three guys in that tier for me. So that's kind of the range I'm looking at with the top tier quarterback. And then once I get outside of that range, when, with my quarterback two, my quarterback three, like I said, I'm looking to pair a Kirk Cousins, a Baker Mayfield, a Tua Tungvaluwa, even a Matt Ryan, maybe if you're higher on him, with one of these rookie quarterbacks, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, Zach Wilson, Trevor Lawrence. <laughs> Jesus. Zach Wilson, Trevor Lawrence, or Mac Jones. So if you can do that, I think that's a great strategy because as you can see, and I'll go over my team now, I'm very strong at the other positions. Even though I faded quarterback, I still like my quarterback core. I still have a good mix of ceiling and floor. And I'm very strong at running back because I have Antonio Gibson and I have Alvin Kamara, two guys with legitimate top five upside. Stephon Diggs, again, a guy that can legitimately finish as the wide receiver one overall. Mike Evans, a guy I believe has top five, top 10 upside because of the touchdowns and the downfield ability and some good uh, upside and floor mix kind of with my flex position with Will Fuller, Elijah Moore, Jarvis Landry, and Corey Davis. At the beginning of the season, I'll probably be starting Jarvis Landry, Corey Davis. And then as the suspension goes up for Will Fuller, as Elijah Moore gets more acclimated to the NFL, I can kind of play matchups with those guys. If you didn't want to go with the two Jets receivers, I suppose you could have went with a Michael Pittman where I went with Corey Davis or something of that nature. So I really like the way I built out my team. Again, if this, if this draft was a bit deeper, 15, 16 rounds, I probably would have been looking to add yeah. more running back depth to my team, a David Johnson in the 15th or something like that. And then I probably would have also been looking to add another tight end potentially if I could. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of comparing, because my big decision obviously would have come at the 201. I do view Dak as that tier break. Uh, I, I view this as a, an elite five quarterback tier. And the fact that I got Dak Prescott a good amount of value uh, after these guys, I'm pretty stoked about that. But if you were kind of going to compare it and you said, listen, uh, you wanted, you were considering a quarterback at the second round if a quarterback had fallen. So let's just kind of compare our rounds two to four. And Overall, I do think in a super flex format, they are comparable in terms of value. So I got Dak, Keenan, and CeeDee Lamb. You got Gibson, Diggs, and Ryan Daniel. If you want to say Diggs slightly over Cal uh, Keenan Allen, Gibson slightly over Lamb, and then Dak slightly over Tannehill, I'd probably agree with that. So that's kind of how your team would look. If you had gone with, let's say, a Devontae Adams here and you paired Ryan Daniel here, 
there's different ways of attacking it. Again, the one thing I'll say, the reason why I prioritize Dak is because of that tear break and because I still truly believe in Keenan Allen and CeeDee Lamb as being potential top the top 10 wide receiver options this year, which kind of led me to quote unquote fading wide receiver for that pocket of value. And you see, I took these five wide receivers, set up my lineup and kind of just addressed everything else after that. Yeah, and I would say if you guys want more information on how we view the quarterback position this year, you could you know get our draft guide using code underdog uh, code FSE on underdogfantasy.com, or you could check out the video I did called "What Makes a League Winning Quarterback," where I basically talked about how I'm attacking the quarterback position, and of course in a super flex format, that's even to a greater emphasis, obviously because you need multiple of them. So as a rule of thumb, I'm typically looking to get my anchor quarterback before round five. So some somewhere in rounds one, two, three, or four, usually rounds three or four for me, because I really do like that third tier of quarterbacks with Brady, Tannehill, and Stafford. And if you don't get a quarterback there, then you're probably going to need to take quarterbacks rounds five, six, and seven to be strong at that position. Because if you miss out on a Tannehill, if you miss out on a Brady, or you miss out on a Justin Herbert or those higher tiers, then you're going to be, you're going to be strong at the other positions, but quarterbacks in the super flex are valuable and quarterbacks with elite upside aren't as deep as they have been in the past. I seriously do think there's only about 12, 13 quarterbacks this year that have that elite upside. And a couple of them are rookies because of their rushing. So uh, that is kind of how we're handling the quarterback position. I hope you guys took a lot away from this super flex draft strategy video. Whoever requested it, leave a comment down below and we'll uh, be sure to pin that and shout you out there because I think we, you know, this was long overdue. We definitely needed to talk about super flex redraft because we don't talk about it too much. So if you did enjoy, as I mentioned, leave a like on the video, comment any of your thoughts, maybe who your favorite quarterback targets are this year in fantasy in Superflex. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. If you're in a one quarterback format, go and check out all of our one quarterback mock drafts and things of that nature. And as I mentioned, if you want our draft guide, you can go to underdogfantasy.com using promo code FSE, deposit $10, you get $25 on top of it to draft with on the site. So you have $35 total on the site for using our promo code and you'll get both of our draft guides for free. So our Superflex rankings our one quarterback rankings, PPR, half PPR, whatever you guys need. That is everything, guys. Peace out. Wire me the money.